All right, so you can see by the background here that this is, this is such a perfect time to have two of the all-time greats in sports business, Andy Dolich, Billy Ball. Wait a minute, I'm sorry, wrong shoulder, Billy Ball. <laughs> And Pat, got, Pat, I couldn't do the seal. I'm sorry. I just couldn't do it. I went quad a candlestick. <laughs> well, so you mean the crab? No. <laughs> the seal, the crab, you're right. I couldn't no, no, go no, no, no. I couldn't go for the crab. <laughs> Although I will say they did a, well, was it a, a, a reminiscence of the crab uh, online somewhere in the last week or so? And I saw some commercials. And man, there was a Yeah, it was. Well, now, uh, unfortunately, our friends in the media, which you're one of, um, with no sports, they have to say, well, what, do, what the hell do we write about? What do we talk about? Yeah. And so they begin to dive back into history, which is, I think it's a good thing. It's therapeutic. I mean, um, it's, uh, uh, you know, when the, when the, like you said, when the light goes on and things begin to loosen up, what are the first things that people are going to do? Yeah. Well, that- so, Pat, um, quad the candlestick, seeing the snow, uh, on the logo, um, when did that, when and how did that come about? Well, <clears throat> I have to say it was like around 1982 when, um, you know, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm the, the marketing guy for the Giants and I'm across the bay from you, the, the new marketing genius for the A's who blows into time. <laughs> blows and into it, time one, does, one thing does, to interrupt, does, which does, I'm, does, I'm an interrupter genius in sports, right, Pat? Oxymoron. Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you blow into town, do Billy Ball and, and all that stuff. And so I'm sitting there at that same time. This was like 1981. So I'm sitting there, you know, trying to trying to figure out a way to sell the worst ballpark ever built, um, Candlestick. Sort of uh, a series of, of teams that were sort of uh, bad. And um, so how do you do it? And so I had Father Guido Sarducci was, uh, he was doing <laughs> television commercials for me. And this was, this was after the North Beach Knights of Columbus demanded that I take the commercials off the air because they thought it was sacrilegious. And I was just saying, you know, I was just, I was trying to deal with this with humor, which is about the only way you could do it, was uh, that we were actually appealing to a higher calling. Uh, they didn't get the joke. So it sort of started all over again. And I hired, um, uh, two two marketing guys and one writer, John Crawford, who um, actually worked on some of your Billy Ball stuff, and uh, and a guy named Gary Freeman. I just said, look, we could, we have to start over, and so that's where the Quad Candlestick was born. Was that it's kind of like there's nothing worse. I mean, you can be great in life, or you can be bad, but the worst thing is to be mediocre and boring. So the point is, let's describe how how bad Candlestick Park is and how, and sympathize with the fans. Um, and so that's how the quad of Candlestick was born. And also our tagline, which was, you think about all the things you could say about your product. Our tagline was hang in there, which didn't really promise anything other than that the team was going to show up and play and that we understood. So the quad of Candlestick was the, the ultimate act of being a Giants fan, which was, staying until the end of an extra inning night game. And it was like your purple heart, your, your quale gear that you got. And in the Bay Area, God bless, pe- people sort of got the joke, thank goodness. And uh, it became a thing. And now it's an urban thing. But that, that was 19, 1983. Mm-hmm. So you think about how long ago that was. And you still see people at the games when there are games or you're on the street and they got those little orange buttons on there. What are they going for on eBay? I don't know. They're, you know, um, and then in 1984, we, when we had the all-star game, the 84 all-star game at Candlestick, we did one with uh, Stu Miller, who was the, you know, was the guy that <laughs> blown got, off blown, the he got blown off the mound, supposedly, where Candlestick got its reputation. So we did a commemorative Stu Miller quad of Candlestick that we gave away at the uh, 1984 All-Star Game. Those things in their package are still, are, are, they continue to grow in value. So so who knew? I think it's cool that it was something that happened so long ago that people still talk about. You know, Ted, as Pat was talking about, hang in there and the quad of candlestick and Billy Ball, it's a different brand of baseball. I, I will take pride for both of us. We came up with tag that had nothing to do with winning of any kind. 
it was all about something else, a state of mind. And I have something that I just discovered that I don't know that there's very many of these that exist in the market. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? That's so, good. Pat, can you tell? Yeah, the Giants. So, when I left the Giants, <laughs> so I've, been, I've left the Giants 11 years ago. And when I left, the Giants threw a big party, and there was, I don't know, five, 600 people there, and they gave away my bobblehead, which are now, I will, and we can talk about that. It's the most valuable bobblehead in Giants history. I'm way more valuable, my bobblehead, more valuable than Mays, McCovey, any of the statues. And it's because it's sort of like the postage stamp, you know, with the airplane flying upside down. It, you know, it's, it, it was made. It, it was Great so, many of them. <laughs> well, if, you have, if you're a collector and you have to have the whole set, that's the one that's the hardest to get. So, um, so my bobblehead on, uh, on eBay is going for, at least it was last time it looked, it's going for like $300. Wow. So, I, anyway, so I they, give people $300 to buy my bobblehead. <laughs> so that little button said, if you look carefully at the fine print, it says the quad of Gallagher. It was a really nice thing. I look being with the giants was, I was there 32 years. It was a incredible experience. I have a, 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 a warm relationship with the organization still. And I, um, and it, anyway, it was a cool thing. Yeah. It was great. Hey, so look, two great minds here. And you, you kind of open the door for this because I, I, we both know this guy. Earlier this week, I was talking with uh, Jamie Zaninovich, who's the deputy commissioner of the Pac-12, and I was just picking his brain about um, what the conversations may be taking place about football coming up in the fall. And in the course of just batting some general things back and forth, Jamie came up with a perfect one-line su succinct summary of where we are. And he said, it's one thing to prepare – safely to play it's another to prepare safely to watch and that seems to be like i said that's it that's the difference where we're heading right it's going to be a lot easier to get people ready or teams ready competitors ready to play right a lot harder to human behavior is going to change isn't it i mean isn't this the thing that the people that are in the jobs that you guys so did so well for so long have to fit how am i going to confront human behavior and how's that going to change that I think Pat and I had a call yesterday in which we were somewhat thankful that we're not in executive positions now because to, to Jamie's point and every other executive in sports, um, the how is impossible to specifically answer right now. And so we've got baseball in the biodome, which is getting a lot of run these days. Um, but you still have a whole bunch of support people, which we're seeing in our society now, the people behind the scenes. You can't just have two teams show up in a major league ballpark and play without hundreds of other people supporting them. Forget about the fans. And baseball, I think, is one of the more tactile sports. Guys are always high-fiving and hugging each other and spitting all over the place and sitting next to each other in the dugout and rubbing their heads and doing all that, how's that going to work? And then to me, it, it ultimately is going to look like after a few games, just practice because you don't have that dynamic tension of the fans. So I just think the how is going to be a great challenge and we are going to see innovation and creativity. Well, you know, linking back to the to my giant, I've had a lot of people who, who like to poke fun at me and whatever. They say, hey, it would have been easy at Candlestick Park. You just get the few thousand people there to sort of spread out, you know, all over the ballpark. And uh, you could come up with the, you know, the, the, the quad coronavirus, which, you know, and the point is, the, the real, the real, I think maybe the great thing for us is that, um, is that, Sports now, which is very important to us, is sort of got to gotten to its proper place in society. It's important and people want it, but it's way down the list if you kind of look at the list of the things people have to have. And if you look at the ripple effect of sports, not just playing the games, but all the people who support it, who the people who uh, who work at the game at the at the for the you know the, the teams, and then you get to the people who cover it. I mean, we've had um, people being laid off at different media outlets 
who cover sports because there's no, no sports to cover. So I think it's a, um, I think society is going to want this again, but there's a lot of other things that are still higher on the priority list than, than going to a baseball game or going to a football game or even watching it. I'm trying to visualize watching one of these events on television that everybody's talking about with no fans in the stands. I mean, you kind of go, wow, how do you do that? What's the point? Do you, do, do you pipe in crowd noise? I mean, do you do that? I, I'm not really sure how you do it, but I think what's, we, we've all sort of got knocked down a few pegs from, you know, people in our business tend to think, tend to think they're very important and uh, we're not, we're not so important. So let me I came up, if you remember Ted and Pat, I came up with a few years ago, the IAF 3000, inflate a fan 3000. The fan <laughs> I, that Andy, came I, out I, have, the I don't have no recollection of that. Oh, no. you don't? No. Oh, I'll have to send you the video. It was a YouTube sensation. So I had somebody create this for me in Memphis when I was with the Grizzlies and it had an electronic opener, an actual seat came down and in the seat was an inflatable and you could customize those inflatable people coming out of the seats. I mean, Pat and I probably both had baseball movies made in our stadiums where they just come in with all of these ridiculous kind of backgrounds. But this is inflate a fan COVID-19. Uh, you'll hear about it soon. Um, and to Pat's point, I think games without fans, and again, that sort of secret sauce that made us spend our adult lives in baseball without that, I just don't see it really having a lot of traction. So I'll tell you, let me throw this at you guys. So um, right about, well, I guess it was right after, right when Andy started with Billy Ball, just about the time you were getting the claw going, Pat, I went to work in Minneapolis at a uh, station that on Saturdays cleared out a studio in the, in the building and they put a wrestling ring in there and they would put two rows of folding chairs around the ring. So they probably had a hundred seats. And on Saturday morning, they would bring in and they would actually take probably two weeks worth of matches. Uh, a guy that became a friend of mine, sadly we lost him last year, Mean Gene Okerlund. I met Gene because Gene was a insurance, ran an insurance agency that I had to work with as a young guy with the hockey team up there. And uh, Mean was the, uh, Gene was doing the announcing as a sideline. It became his full-time thing. But the point was this became a syndicated TV show that they sent out to markets all across, mostly the Midwest back then. It was the breeding ground for what we all became. It was where Hulk Hogan started, et cetera. Anyway, it was worked. It worked on TV. You just, you saw the matches that the, the, you, you, you still saw. And of course, wrestling is the classic, you know, good versus evil, right? And all the great wrestling promoters, McMahon is just the latest of them. were all terrific at setting up storylines. And to me, he had the passion, he had the good versus evil. And you didn't have 20,000 people in the building. You had 100 people in the building. 100 people screaming. To me, that worked. Yeah. So is that, is that, is that crazy? Well, that's a great point because boxing, wrestling, all you watch are the first two or three rows of the VIPs. Um, and, you know, here you have Dana White talking. Oh, I just bought a private island. I'm going to fly the fighters to the private island. And that's how we're going to do things. I guess you can do it that way. Uh, but it just won't seem the same when you're used to tens of thousands of people. Well, but I think that just the whole idea of good versus evil, I mean, you get down to something like the Harlem Globetrotters. I mean, they played all kinds of games, thousands of games over the years against a team that always lost, the Washington Generals, and it, they, they made it entertaining because it really was, in their case, was way more than who won the game. It was all the stuff that happened during the game, which is sort of where, you know, Andy and I and the other people who tried to figure out a way to make this interesting finally figured out is that you had to you had to appeal to more than just people who were hanging on every pitch you had to appeal to people who were really just some of them just looking for something to do and to make it more entertaining and I think that's the that's the the, the thing that the thinking that teams and organizations and leagues sort of have to get back to is they got to take this rather than thinking big 
I think first they have to think small and think about how it relates to the yeah. people who play it, the people who work in it, and the people who pay to watch it. As you were talking, I was thinking about uh, John as uh, the crazy crab or the Philly fanatic. I mean, <laughs> how do you interact in an environment like this? Uh, that's, that's a bit of a challenge. So it, no ball dudes, no ball dudes. Right. You know, so I've heard some people uh, question maybe sick of baseball, take advantage of this because we know baseball has, has fought the battle of demographics in recent years. We all hear the studies, the average age of somebody watching a ball game is getting older and older. Can baseball re take advantage of this and reinvent itself a little bit and make itself, or at least perhaps establish with this younger generation what we all grew up with, right? Which was baseball was your essential game. Well, I, I just, as sort of therapy, I just watched the, uh, for last week, I just watched the entire Ken Burns baseball series from uh -huh beginning to end, which was, which is actually, if, for somebody who's looking for something to do, it's a good thing to do. You know, I think that what, what happens is that because we're, the, the one common, common thread through all this stuff is fear. I mean, we all, I think in order to, to get better, I think the game and the people in the game and the people who are, they have to take themselves a little less seriously. <laughs> and have to think more about what the basics are um, of, of, of what it is that makes this important. What is it? It's the, it's the, the competition. I mean, you can play a baseball game in, in a sandlot and, and the competition can be great. I think if we're going to make this, bring this back as a, as a thing for people to follow and to do and to all that stuff, we're going to have to, uh, to have a piece of humble pie and really begin to think about, um, to think about the people involved rather than how much money um, it's going to generate. And my fear, as Pat used the word, is that if you look at the younger generation, um, they're playing baseball with their thumbs. They're not playing stickball. They're not necessarily playing Little League baseball. And they could look at all of the gamification of sports, which is incredible. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar business. And COVID-19 has definitely knocked the crap out of all sports. Will this gigantic generation go, eh, you know what, the live deal, I don't need it. I control my players. I create my players. I create the gamification. That scares me if I was being paid by a a team in the pros or college you, you know the teams that, that you two worked for where we live right here so last year the A's started this thing that became apparently pretty popular where they sold basically a bar seat out in the outfield at a club <clears throat> and you could walk in any game you wanted to with your phone right and scan it and you had this seat in a bar that happened to have a ball game going on out there and I know Pat I talked to one of your longtime colleagues of the Giants last summer, and he was telling me the same thing. Every study they had was that a very small percentage of fans that came to the games were actually watching and hanging, as you said, hanging on pitches, which as kids, when we went to games, and our dads took us to games, that's what you did. You kept score, and you hung, you actually watched the game. Um, and that's what, to me, would be the, the worrisome thing would be if that's no longer there, I mean, if, if going to the game to watch the game has diminished dramatically, is that where you, is that the small place where you have to start, Pat? Do you have to get people back to well, watch the game? The way I would kind of look at it is it's kind of like spending more time worrying about the frosting than worrying about the cake. Meaning, you know, the, what, what are the basic things that we do here? What are the basic values that we have with this? I think that sort of we have to return to that and, and I, you know, I never wanted to be one of those old people that, you know, used to complain about stuff, you know, and I guess I've sort of become one, but I, I think I look at the, at the sort of the beauty of competition, um, the, the people who are, all the people who are involved, that's what, that's what, that's what I miss is the engagement with the competition and also the engagement with people around it, whether they're vendors or people who sit next to me or others. Or, or listening to, I mean, in, in, we're blessed to be able to listen to, you know, Dwayne Kuyper, um, Mike Kruko, um, um, 
John Miller, King. Yeah. And, Dave yeah. Fleming, and Dave Fleming. And so, but, but just that thread where you don't really have to do anything, you can just listen is one of the, there's no other sport that sort of does it like that or has that to it. So all those elements that sort of, that sort of tell the story are going to have to come back. But I think they're all going to come back with a with sort of a dose of humble pie, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, and the the sort of compartmentalization you're hearing all the sports talk about shorter seasons, sort of that plays to the nanosecond attention span of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. One of the attractions in baseball is that it is a long soap opera. When you think you're out of it, and then a month later you're in it when you never heard of that player and then he comes up and just burns it. Um, all of that is, it's part of a life. Each baseball season is part of life. And one of the scariest messages that's come out in the last two or three days above and beyond the horrific numbers of people that are, that are dying is Anthony Fauci, who's sort of become the true North of reality saying, yeah, you know, I think in the future people should never shake hands. What? what? That scares the living crap out of me. Just... See, I, miss, I, I miss giving people hugs. I mean, if I was actually next You're to a hugger. Doctors, I would give each one of you a hug, but I guess we can't do that anymore. Oh, now you'd serve three to five in hard time if you, <laughs> if you walked out of your house. You're going down and you're being tased. And, and, yeah. and that goes back to the the phrase I used earlier when we started to say human behavior, right? I mean, human behavior, sports is just a very small piece of this pie that is going to extend to theater and, and uh, opera and ballet and rock concerts, music concerts, community theater, restaurants, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's really, sports is maybe going to be the more, more visible part up front of, of this challenge is that how is human behavior going to change? Well, and, and, and just live events in general, whether it's music, whether it's sports, whether it's theater, um, you know, if society needs art, they sort of need those types of things. So now all of them are, are in the same boat. They all have to figure out a way to re-engage with the people who perform. And also then beyond that, with the sort of concentric circle of people involved who are, you know, the employees, the fans, sponsors, everybody. And it's, um, it, I guess if, if you sort of look for some good to come out of all this, maybe it's going to force people in the business to really uh, not take that stuff for granted as much. You know, Andy, you did something with the A's that I've, I've thought about this a lot in the last couple of weeks that if baseball does get back in some form here coming up and it has baseball has such a, need to get its regional sports networks, their programming. It's a big part of baseball's financial picture. But you did something with the A's, and it was on public TV. And I, I can't remember the name. You could tell the all, story. Ball game. Ball game. Ball game. But we, and, I, and you had maybe a very small part of it, and it was phenomenal because you basically, we were inside a game. It was one game, but we had people stationed. You had people stationed in all different areas that you would never, it was, it just broke down the traditional mold of a couple of people sitting up in a booth telling stories. And to me, that's the sort of access, different way to look at baseball. If I were doing it today, that would be something I'd be urging the baseball team I was with to do. Let's do 50 games like that. Yeah, it's like ESPN's hard knocks. And we beat them by, I don't know, 15 years to the punch. Yeah. And, it, and there was a guy named Jim Scalum. Uh, just an absolutely great guy, and Pat dealt with the KQED team. Uh, Nat, right? I mean, they they had quality people. They were totally involved in the community, and essentially, we just turned the cameras around, and so they could sit in a meeting with Sandy Alderson and Roy Eisenhart. They went into the locker room with Steve Vucinich. They were with you in the dugout, if I remember, mm -hmm. viewing Tony or players. And that's come that way because the fans want to know what's going on behind that door. I want to be in that. So clearly with all the advancements in digitalization, um, that's, that's going to happen. But, you know, as, as we've talked about the human element and that interaction to see the greatest athletes in the world do their thing in an unscripted setting. Yeah. How is that going to work? 
Well, it's the ultimate form of democracy. I mean, to pull out one of our old yogi favorites, he says, if people don't want to come to the ballpark, you can't stop them. And so that means, I used to say the only real difference between uh, a bad baseball season and a Broadway play is that um, at least with a Broadway play, when the action stinks, you can shut it down. Where is in, <laughs> in baseball, you sort of go to the end of the season and you know, it, it, the quality of whatever it is that you're doing, the team, the whole experience gets revealed over a piece of time. And I remember I used to, I used to pray that if we're, when, for the Giants, God, I said, if we're going to be bad, I'd like to wait a little longer in, in the season before that's revealed. Well, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, if people knew right away that we were going to be bad, then um, that was, you know, that was like the death knell because then you, ha you knew that you were going to have to play until the end of September. So, I, I, look, I think, I think a dose of, of being humble is probably good for all of us who are in this business or were in this business. I think it, 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 it gives us a chance to um, think about, you think about all the different elements. Think about players now who were getting in shape for, for, their, for their season and now they're at home with their kids or they're doing whatever. Um, you know, it's, everybody is dealing with this in a different way. And that, that sort of that human connection where we all, like I say, the thing that unites us all is sort of fear, um, probably is a good thing in, in terms of figuring out the right way to bring all this stuff back. Well, you just think about the three of us, if we were going to do this, we'd meet the night at the old pro, right? <laughs> Our, high five each other, you'd hug everybody hug back and we're doing it and we're doing it this way yeah holy crap let me throw another one out at you guys and see what you think because this this is another memory i've had this is more recent it was probably six years ago uh and the pac-12 network had started doing every school's spring football game and that became a problem because football coaches as you well understand uh, take paranoia off the scales right and they realized, wait a minute, our games are on television. Our opponents are going to see what, what formations we run. So they coaches started <laughs> dialing back. And basically spring football games, which to this day, they've been pretty much eliminated because they're just glorified practices. Anyway, I'm at Arizona doing a game. And Rich Rodriguez at the time is fairly new at Arizona. He's trying to drum up interest. It's not. It's a basketball school. So we're doing his spring game. He finally, at one point, they get to the fourth quarter, and he takes a whiteboard, and he just – white grease board, four corners, and he puts four basic plays, and he walks up in the stands, <laughs> and he has a fan. All right, you pick the next play. Fantastic. Pick the play, and then I'll radio all my headset down to the offensive guy to tell the quarterback what play to run. This went on for 15 minutes. The fans loved it. Right. That was in your head. <laughs> it was, and I had no idea we were caught completely off guard that he was going to do this. And I told him later that Rodriguez, that was brilliant. It was, you know, it was engaging people in something that they would not expect to be. And who doesn't sit in the stands calling plays, right? Everybody calls plays. And to Pat's point, you know, we have amongst the three of us, we have some institutional knowledge. So you using that great example, it was a guy named Bill Vec who did the exact same thing in 1954 with his fans at a Sox game. And he had a play a game where he would let them make the manager's decision. And he would do it on like three on five by seven cards and they would vote for a play. And to your point in football, I never quite understand why with analytics and metrics, you always see a coach like Gruden, right? They're always like this when they're calling a play when everybody knows every play in the history of football. What the hell is that about? Well, it's, it's also, yeah, it's, in, <laughs> it's also like the whole spring training phenomenon. I mean, in baseball, spring training used to be the place that you would go and you, you know, you'd buy a, a ticket for a few bucks and go sit in wherever you wanted to sit and watch guys getting, getting ready for the season and players were getting ready. You know, nobody was, cheering at spring training games nobody was cheering because nobody was really keeping score and then all of a sudden now it, it, over the last couple of decades it's become a phenomenon i'm not saying there's anything wrong with it i think it's fine but the point is 
cheering at a spring training game. Um, I mean, I think it was, um, I think it was Mike Kruko said, you know, talked about the importance of spring training. He said, well, does anybody know who won the Cactus League championship last year? Yeah, or we had mentioned that, I think, yeah. to the days that we were in Phoenix and Scottsdale. And we were way ahead of the time with social distancing. You'd see that obese person taking out six seats, right? Laying with slathering suntan oil on them, pounding beer after beer, having the greatest time of their life, not even knowing who the crap was playing in the game. Well, and, and, and Teddy, I, I got to say, say one to you is that, you know, because you broadcast virtually every sport out there, you think about, okay, baseball and football and basketball, but what about the Olympics? What about the Olympics that are, that are held out there every four years or so? And if you're an athlete who have a short window in your career and you're training for what's going to be your opportunity, I think about somebody like Katie Ledecky, who is maybe one of the greatest swimmers of all time. And she's got this, this window to, uh, to, to do the things to the best of her ability while she has to do it. How do you, what do you say to somebody like that? Or how do you explain that? Yeah, no, I mean, well, the Olympic thing, and um, I was around a little bit when this virus started uh, because of the proximity to Stanford and the swimmers. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's so different than what we've been talking about in team sport because these are, and as, without going too long here, I've always partitioned the Olympics into two divisions. There are Olympic sports and there are sports in the Olympics. Basketball, tennis, golf now. In the summer. Climbing, rock climbing. <laughs> um, hockey in winter is not an Olympic sport, but they're sports in the Olympics. The yeah. Olympic sports are in the summers, the traditions, track and field, gymnastics, swimming, you know, all the way through the wrestlings and, and rowing and archery where that's the only thing in sport that they do They strive. There's no professional reward. There's the Olympic medal reward. And so what has happened for those athletes in the Olympic sports, um, despite the fact that in Japan, for example, this has not really hit very hard. This virus, Japan has done a very good job of controlling it, which I believe was one of the reasons why the postponement was a little slow to come because in Japan, they're looking right. Oh, actually, it's not too bad here. But the problem was athletes across the world were not being able to prepare the way that they needed to, to be at their best for their one time every four year shot. But Pat, to your point, the one year postponement is significant for people on the wings. If you're 31 or 32, and now you're coming back a year later, that's huge. And on the other end, if you're 16 or 17, and this was a year too soon for you next year, you may be ready. And then that takes a spot away from somebody who's 23 or 27 or 31, right? That's, that was one of the things I thought about when they were making these decisions that it, it was secondary, but to me it was significant because I know if I'm an athlete, that's what I'm thinking about. Hey, this is my time, but next year there could be three people nipping at my heels that are going to be ready to take my spot. And that rolls into, we've had these markers in the last month and it seems like the last four years already. I mean, Rudy Gobert test positive. Uh, sports are postponed. Uh, March Madness becomes sadness. Um, the Olympics goes down. Uh, baseball goes, we don't really know. All spring sports in the NCAA, the four majors in golf, Wimbledon, which you've been associated with. Now we have the next big marker out there, the NFL, who's there taking a very quiet position. But again, bringing tens of thousands of people together in a sport where bodily fluids are exchanged on every single play, um, and some on the field, uh, not just in the stands. I, I just, it's beyond me how that's going to work in this period of time where the death tolls are li literally climbing every day. But aren't they wrestling? Aren't they the wrestling example? I, gave? I mean, they're the sport that could thrive with just yeah. TV, right? I mean, yeah. They don't, I mean, they don't need fans in the stands. And as you, Andy, as you did, you were part of this in your long NBA run. The NBA started this of playing music during the play, right? Yeah. At Madison Square Garden. I, I don't know if, should, if they're doing it now for Nick Games, but forever, the Garden was the one holdout, right? The Garden. Right. Fans refused to allow 
music while the ball was in play. Other than Jimmy Dolan's rock group, they play all of his music. <laughs> but if the NFL did something, I mean, obviously they'd have to allow the quarterback to call the signals of the line, and we understand that. But the rest of the time, you could pipe in artificial stuff. To me, the NFL, and, and I, I think, and I've been talking a lot about this, I think college football has a far greater obstacle to clear than okay. the NFL because college football – the emphasis for the first time, maybe in our lifetime, is going to be on the college, not the football, right? It's college. So a college has to open, a university has to open before you can have football at the university. That, to me, is going to be a way tougher a hurdle. To point do. about the Yogi Berra quote, I just think about SEC football. Yeah, right. You're going to keep people away. They're already tailgating for the LSU Georgia game today. And it's like, oh, you're telling me there's no game or I can't go? I don't think so. Well, and, you know, in like the NFL, you think about just the, you know, watching, watching it as a member of the stands, watching guys on a gridiron, you know, a distance away. But if you can imagine actually being on the gridiron face to face with somebody else who you're, you know, it's, I mean, it's sort of, in a way, sort of becomes like the Lions and the Christians. I mean, it, you know, if you want to take it back to its basics is, you know, you've got people down there in this skirmish, they're probably doing some damage to their health, even maybe even more damage to their health now that you have to worry about people breathing on you. But, you know, as spectators, you're sitting there holding a beer, kind of going, well, you know, hey, it's their problem. I, you know, I think, I think, I think all, sort of all bets are off, so to speak. And yeah, the, gladiator need, the gladiatorial talking about, sports. Talking, talking about gambling, talking about gambling. Yeah. Think about all the, the people who, who do gambling as their hobby, who all of a sudden now don't have, to, don't have anything to gamble on. I was in Vegas for the Pac-12 basketball tournament when the world stopped. Yeah. And Thursday morning, as we were told to get out, to leave, and I walked through the MGM where we were staying, a couple of the sports books. Second biggest weekend of the year in Vegas is the, was the weekend after this one. The first weekend of March Madness is the second biggest weekend of the year in Vegas after Super Bowl. But this weekend was the tournament weekends. is still huge, empty. Not a soul in a sports book. Holy God. That, that was the sledgehammer moment across the well, head. The people. socialization of March Madness for people that would not know anything about basketball, but got in the office pool or loved it or loved the colors or the mid-majors, wiped away. Five billion dollars is bet on Super Bowl Sunday. Five billion dollars. Yeah. And, you know, to that point, We've just talked about every part of human interaction, which has come down or gone away in sports, but more importantly, life is much more important than sports. So let's circle back and end this thing where we're a little bit where we started. Andy, when Commissioner Scott Boris allows baseball <laughs> to start in Arizona, we have our opening day tickets. Pat's going to take us opening day at Scottsdale's. How awesome is that? Really nice. What's the what's the arcade seat like? Is there an arcade seat at Scottsdale Stadium, Pat? I don't know, but I think we're all going to have masks on, probably. Maybe masks with cactus on the front. I, I don't know. I mean, well, I'll send you guys. I just wrote this about twenty minutes ago. It's called "Take Me Out to the Biodome." I'm gonna send you my new lyrics. And, you know, um, I think we'll wait and see. Teddy, I think just to, to maybe be serious for a, a moment on this is I think if there's any good that came out of this, because we all, after we, you know, go through all the, um, the, the emotions, we all sort of have to look for some good on all this. Maybe the good in all this is anybody who is in the sports or entertainment business, hopefully is going to take themselves a little less seriously than they did before. And they're going to think about the basics, the basic values of, um, of, of appealing to a, a customer or of doing things of sportsmanship. Those, the, just, there's nothing wrong with those values. Maybe the, the good thing about all this is that it's gonna, ha it's gonna force people to get back to those values. Yeah. Well, let, 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 look, I feel like we're the three guys sitting on the park bench. We just don't, well, I had my cup of coffee. 
I don't know what you guys, now there you go, good. So anyway, let's do this again. Anytime. Although. The although, old pro together, uh, banging a few beers, even yes. now. Although Andy, yeah. I think the atmosphere may be a lot better. It looks like Pat's got the right idea above him. Oh yeah. Happy hour. Yeah. Hey, you know, well, it's all, it, it, sports and booze is always going together, sort of like hand and Pat hand. has expanded that in many ways. It's not just an hour now. It's like a week or a month. It's good. It's all good. Well, Andy Dolish, who is the most – I always have said Steve Buscemi is the second most famous guy to come from Valley Stream, Long Island. Andy Dolich knows that the two words that a New Yorker has no understanding of, closing time. 